Hi, good morning. Once again, this is Mr. Reyes with Careers Unlimited, and I'm here to, um, to cover some of the new material, uh, Chapter 12, Care of the Obstetric Patient. This is a very specialized area for those of you who might be interested in working with the, the female population, uh, especially the, the females that um, are in a, are in a state of uh, pregnancy, and maybe they're beginning or they're in the middle, or perhaps they've even uh, given birth at this point already. So you'll be gaining some knowledge and I uh, hope uh, you might be interested in this field. It's a very, very interesting field to, to work in. So we're, let's get started uh, discussing the, the, uh, the different populations of, uh, of uh, female patients. So first goal is to describe some of the pre-existing conditions that uh, can complicate a, a pregnancy for a female. There's a lot of uh, patients, especially in our region, uh, that have a high risk of uh, or high risk pregnancies. Some of these uh, patients uh, carry with them or develop during the pregnancy uh, complications such as uh, hypertension and diabetes. Uh, some of them have um, obesity, which also uh, affects uh, the the pregnancy. Uh, you know, uh, or they carry uh, carriage of the baby for the amount of time. So we'll discuss some of those uh, possible conditions. Uh, we'll look at some of the complications that can develop during the pregnancy, which can threaten the life of the female uh, and also the, uh, the baby. Uh, some of the uh, gest gestation, we'll discuss some of those gestation um, that can cause pregnancy to be high risk. What actually causes the, the female to be a high risk? And high risk means um, anything that can potentially affect her, her health, her well being, as well as her, her baby. Look at some of the reasons why some females uh, decide to or opt out or may require to have a cesarean section for their for the birth when you know the baby's uh, about to come out. So why do they need it, and uh, is it a good choice for everybody? Uh, and lastly, we'll look at some of the common postpartum complications after the female gives birth to the baby. What can happen afterwards? It sounds like you give birth and you're done, but in reality, some other complications may occur, and we'll look at some of those. And what is your job? What is your role during this whole process? The antepartum before the female uh, gives birth and, and uh, during the labor process, and of course, after the delivery. So let's start looking at the at the possible um, high-risk pregnancies. What is a high-risk high pregnancy? It's a, it's a pregnancy where the condition, a condition may affect the, the status of the, of the baby, or it may, may affect, of course, the health of the, of the mother. This, uh, this is more than a normal risk. Now, any pregnancy can become risky at any point, but having a, 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 a person that has pre-existing conditions, such as diabetes, mellitus, uh, heart disease, and substance abuse. And let's look at how each one of these individually increases the risk of complications for the female as well as for the, for the baby. So diabetes mellitus is a condition where the adult is unable to produce enough insulin to meet the needs of uh, the metabolic needs of individual. However, many times uh, the female uh, does not have diabetes. What happens is that after uh, the woman becomes pregnant and the demands um, for, for insulin increase, because the female many times they start uh, eating more uh, to meet the needs of the developing um, embryo and fetus, a, the increasing demands for, for insulin are unable to be met. So the female now uh, you know, starts to develop what they call uh, <clears throat> pregnancy-induced diabetes, or there's another name for it. Uh, they call it um, di uh, gestational uh, diabetes. So gestation means uh, pregnancy. Okay, so they develop this, um, this problem that increases uh, the risk of, uh, of the fetus getting complications with the mother. Now, what happening? What exactly does diabetes? Uh, how does it affect? Well, the mother has a high risk of developing other medical problems such as um, heart disease, where your arteries can get uh, occluded with um, with plaque. They can develop high blood pressure. They can develop a uh, kidney failure, uh, lose uh, uh, lose their sight. They could also even lose uh, sensation to the nerves or to the nerve ending. So there's a lot of complications that occur now directly. Uh, as as far as the pregnancy is concerned, uh, the diabetes can cause um, 
uh, or have a high risk for causing uh, urinary tract infections and also lead to infections, which are, of course, infections of the urinary system, which can, of course, complicate the, um, the, the, the gestation of the pregnancy and uh, among other problems. So having a diabetes during, um, during this process can also lead to a miscarriage, which is, of course, something uh, that we don't want. All right, so chronically elevated uh, glucose levels can also cause the baby to become very large. Uh, when a female is consuming a lot of food, the body produces more insulin to utilize that, um, that, that uh, sugar. However, all those hormones, insulin is a growth hormone. Uh, what causes this is the baby will start to grow very, very fast. So in, in the end result, the, the female may give birth to a, what we call a macro a macro baby or a large baby. Large is usually over six to seven pounds. Uh, this will cause the baby to become uh, dependent on glucose. So when the baby does uh, uh, arrive and he's born, they are going to be very dependent on high levels of, uh, of sugar. So they start to become very jittery and they start to have a, a very um, particular way of crying as, as the body is demanding uh, glucose levels. So again, Having diabetes uh, can be a, a short-term problem during the pregnancy, but it also predisposes a woman to develop diabetes type 2, diabetes mellitus type 2 as an, as an older adult. So again, what predisposes a female to uh, develop gestational diabetes, it's more a problem of um, obesity. Most of the females that uh, developed gestational diabetes are already uh, having uh, medical problems uh, that uh, predispose them to developing this condition. So it doesn't happen just because of the just because of the baby who's coming in, but all uh, because uh, there is already some prior medical problems developing. So that is uh, one of the pre-existing conditions that occurs or can increase the high risk of a pregnancy. And uh, I was uh, right now discussing the um, the diabetes because it's so so uh, common here in the valley. How it, it can affect uh, the development of the fetus, uh, the complications that can occur because of the diabetes. And now moving on to the second condition, which is also very common, is heart disease. The heart disease. Um, I don't see it as as a big big problem because uh, most of the females that uh, are in in you know, are, in a, have, are pregnant, don't necessarily have hypertension because they're usually young. However, there are so there are those groups of uh, females that have a, a hypertensive problem because uh, of obesity, and obesity uh, of course causes heart disease in the long run. But it can develop; they can develop hypertension even in their early years. So, heart disease can complicate pregnancy, uh, where the they may develop um, anemias or the heart is unable to meet the demands of the fetus. And this, of course, places the, the pregnancy at very high risk. And down here, almost every every other um, pregnancy is, uh, is a high risk. So frequent um, females uh, that have hypertension uh, can develop complications. Um, you told me you worked in, a, in an area with uh, pregnant females, right, obstetrics? And I'm pretty sure you saw a lot of these problems, the most common one being hypertension. Uh, hypertension can cause um, what they call preeclampsia. Actually, they call it a preeclampsia when a female's pregnant and they have high blood pressure, which is usually one above 140 over 90. Uh, how does this affect the, the, or you know, increases the risk of, of uh, miscarriaging? When a female has a high risk of, um, uh, or has high blood pressure, puts a lot of uh, you know pressure on the area of the cervix uh, where the where the you know or the uterus rather where the where the baby is attached and all that pressure can in, in the long run or not even long run during the pregnancy can cause the the uh, the bag right to, to, to detach from the uterus and of course they would have a miscarriage but also the uh, hypertension can develop and progress into a higher um, a more severe level called eclampsia. And at this point, the female can, um, can obviously miscarriage 
very easily, but they can also start to have uh, other medical problems such as seizures or even strokes or other even heart attacks depending on the condition of the, of the, of the person. So as you can imagine, the demands of the pregnancy are you know increase the demands of the heart and if the woman has heart disease, they may not be able to meet um, those demands during the, the labor process because obviously that requires a lot of effort from the female, which of course will increase the blood pressure even higher and possibly you know, pose a very high risk for, for the female uh, as far as strokes are concerned. So that is why hypertension or heart disease can, can uh, severely increase the risk of having a miscarriage or complications during the pregnancy. Uh, substance abuse is not too common, but uh, I do believe that uh, alcohol and drugs can affect the development of the fetus. We know uh, for sure alcohol can affect um, the baby's birth. They usually uh, are very small. They have a low birth weight. They can develop um, uh, slow le or learning problems, and they're actually born uh, as addicted to alcohol. Uh, there's a term that we use for those babies. <clears throat> for especially for for people that are uh, addicted to their alcohol or drugs, they um, they can contract obviously other other diseases uh, such as hepatitis or HIV if the if the female is uh, not, not being careful. I actually had a patient, a very young lady, she must have been in her twenties. Uh, she uh, was treating her because she had HIV, and um, she she mentioned that she'd been obviously been hanging around with the wrong people. And she ended up being pregnant, and she had a baby. And this her child now was a young child, maybe school age kid. He also had HIV. So, a substance abuse is a, is a big problem, <clears throat> and of course can affect the the uh, the birth of the baby, including having congenital anomalies. I believe that a a, a couple who is planning to have a family and uh, is seriously thinking about having a child should stop uh, drinking alcohol probably at least six months before um, they, you know, they plan the child. Because uh, I think that if a child or an individual, an adult is consuming alcohol, it can affect your, your DNA. And of course that DNA will be passed on to your, to your children. So having damaged DNA or alcohol you know, alcohol consumption obviously can affect that child. Now, ectopic pregnancies. This is um, other conditions that can occur uh, during uh, during the pregnancy. Uh, once a female does become pregnant and the um, the embryo starts to develop in a <clears throat> in a woman's uh, uterus, sometimes the the fertilized egg does not implant itself in the uterus where it's supposed to. Sometimes it's outside the uterus. Sometimes it's in the fallopian tubes. Sometimes it's in the in the um, in the way down in the ovaries. So these pregnancies are called ectopic pregnancies. They're, these are pregnancies that are not in the in the correct place, and uh, they can the egg fertilized egg actually can pretty much implant itself anywhere. But uh, of course, that's uh, that pregnancy is not going to go very far because uh, that's not where the eggs or the baby is supposed to develop. Uh, there's not going to be enough nutrients and it's not going to be able to latch on to the, to the uterus like it's supposed to, and eventually the woman will have a miscarriage. So rarely the fertilized egg may implant in the cervix or, a, or even the abdomen. Uh, there's a lot of places. Uh, sometimes females don't even know they have their, their pregnant. Uh, until later on, they discover that they may have a, an ectopic pregnancy. So what happens um, if they do have an ectopic pregnancy? Well, they're probably going to have a miscarriage, right? Uh, or spontaneous abortion, as they call it. Spontaneous abortions, um, the loss of a fetus before the 20th week, which is about the five months. Uh, again, depending where the uh, fertilized egg is implanted, that's where you, uh, the length of the or duration of the pregnancy. Sometimes they are in the uterus, but they're not exactly high up in the uterus. If the fertilized egg is implanted, lower, uh, in the lower part of the uterus, closer to the cervix, uh, it's not gonna work. The weight of the baby will eventually, eventually uh, make its way down into the cervix and the female will have a, an abortion. Sometimes they have complete abortions where all the 
uh, the colic, the other contents or the embryo will just come out, kind of like a hemorrhage kind of um, abortion. Sometimes it's incomplete. Some of it may come out, but but it, not completely. So when somebody, a female, has a, a an incomplete abortion, what happens is that some of the contents that are still in the uterus um, will stay there, and sometimes those contents will get infected, and the woman will start to develop symptoms of you know abdominal pain, uh, cramping, and so on. And uh, this is when they go to the to the doctor and, and they're diagnosed with um, with the, you know, the incomplete abortion. And of course, these abortions or these spontaneous abortions will require what they call a DNC, right? The dilation and curtage, or also known as um, what do they call it? Uh, pretty much is that you know to remove uh, the contents of uh, whatever's left in there. A missed abortion, some females may experience a an abortion or some small contents or they expel, um, they may think it's probably a, you know, a part of a, uh, the, the menstrual period when in reality they're, what they're experiencing is a, a missed abortion. They didn't know that that they were even pregnant. A lot of times they don't even know that. Uh, again, it just depends on, on the females, on their, on the quality of the, of the pregnancy. Another problem that happens with pregnancy is, uh, is an incompetent cervix. Some females, uh, unfortunately, have a, a, a cervix, which is the lower part, right, of the, of the uterus. So you have the uterus and then low, you have the, the, the cervix, where they call it the birth canal, where the baby's going to come out. Uh, sometimes this cervix is very weak. The muscles are very weak, and it, they're unable to hold the baby, especially if the baby is implanted in the uterus, okay, uh, in the lower part of the uterus, then as the baby's developing, okay, the weight starts to pull on the uterus and the baby wants to come out already. So this can obviously pose um, a problem. The, the female can start giving birth uh, prematurely and end up with a premature baby. So to prevent this, to prevent this, uh, some of the doctors uh, can actually do a, uh, what they call a, a, uh, a cervical surplus. So the cervix, right, as the baby will come out through here, okay, and to prevent the baby from coming out, they pretty much close it. You know, like some of the purses, they pull string, right, and the, and the cervix closes so the baby doesn't come out. But even like that, the baby will come out with the weight if the woman continues to live her normal state, normal life. So in addition to doing that cervical lodge, the, the woman will have to be in bed rest for a long time, uh, sometimes until the baby is actually delivered. And uh, sometimes the woman will also have to be in the uh, Trendelenburg position with the head down so the weight can come down so the baby doesn't push the, you know, push down and want to come out. So this, this, uh, this kind of a pregnancy uh, is, can become very difficult to manage because the baby can can come out at any time, especially after the uh, the third, you know, second trimester. You know, the three, four, five months, the baby's already you know developed pretty big and it starts putting pressure on that cervix. And if it comes out, obviously there can have a miscarriage or a very premature baby, if something uh, you know that's not desired. So. A patient with an incompetent cervix would be on complete bed rest for before the cervix lodge, uh, in Trendelenburg's position, which is pressure in the cervix. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, the patient can start having abdominal pain, uterine contractions, or even fluid leaking from the vagina. That may be that uh, the baby is actually coming out. So once the baby starts to come out, they can also try to slow down the contractions or stop them, uh, you know, they, they're going to be in and out of the hospital because of this problem. So an incompetent cervix is another complication that can occur uh, during the pregnancy. Another a complication that happens, but not too often, I never got to see this one, it's hyperemesis gravidarum. Hyper means high, emesis means vomit, okay? Uh, gravidarum obviously means severe. So a person that has severe nausea and vomiting uh, and is pregnant, it's called hyperemesis gravidarum. So uh, some females, you know, you have your morning sickness, you don't feel well, you're like, oh, you know, you want to 
vomit all over the place. Uh, sometimes this emesis or this vomiting does not go away. And this can become a very severe problem. Why? Well, because the female will become dehydrated. Now, a lot of fluid will be shifted from the, from the, from the, from the fetus and uh, the fetus will be dehydrated. And that can cause problems for the fetus and also for the, for the female. So hyperemesis gravidarum uh, can affect, uh, severely affect um, the health of the female leading to uh, probably premature birth and uh, maybe even other medical complications such as a, a kidney failure or kidney problems. So the woman may have to be in uh, receiving IV fluids uh, very frequently, either in the hospital or in the home setting to prevent, um, to prevent uh, uh, dehydration. And they may also even require what they call TPN, the total parental nutrition, uh, so that the female can receive nutrients. Because if they're unable to eat orally, they have to get nutrients. Uh, IV fluids is not, is not enough uh, to keep the woman uh, well-nourished. And of course, the heat is developing you know, in good state. So TPN is another um, option for nutrition status. The female would then require central line. It becomes a very complicated um, pregnancy because of this hyperemesis gravidarum. Um, another uh, complication that I mentioned earlier, touched on when we talked about heart disease is gestational hypertension. This is also called high, high blood pressure during pregnancy. Now, I, I said uh, blood, blood pressure uh, 140 over 90 is considered high, okay? And it usually develops away after around the fifth or sixth month. As the baby's growing and growing, it increases uh, the demands in the heart, okay? So if a female starts off with a blood pressure of 130 over 80, okay? So that's already like borderline blood pressure, hypertension. And uh, as the baby just starts to increase the demands of fluid and, 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 and workload on the heart, the resistance against the heart becomes bigger, right? Uh, the weight of the fetus starts to put pressure on, on, on the, we call the, the vena cava, the lower vena cava, okay? The baby's pushing down in it. So the heart has to pump harder so that the blood flow can come back. Okay, that's why we see a lot of the swelling in the legs because of the pressure of the baby on the, on the, um, on the vena cava here. So the fluid comes back from the legs up and through the vena cava. And here's the baby putting pressure and the fluid can't come back up as easily. So the heart has to pump even harder to make sure that it happens. And this of course develops uh, hypertension or gestational hypertension. I said earlier, this hypertension can quickly progress into preeclampsia, okay, which is just high blood pressure. Um, you see a lot of uh, uh, protein being spilled into the urine because of the the increased pressure in the in the kidneys. Remember, the kidneys filter the blood, and uh, protein is not supposed to be excreted; it's supposed to be taken in. But because of the pressure from the heart, it, it pushes it into the into the urine, and we see this problem. It's called uh, preeclampsia, and of course, it progresses into eclampsia, okay, which is a very severe uh, high blood pressure, usually uh, 200 millimeters of mercury over 100. It becomes very uh, severe. Uh, you can see a lot of edema, all that swelling in the lower legs, and of course, seizures. Now, this is considered an emergency. A female that has this kind of problem uh, should be or should have been in the hospital uh, when the blood pressure starts to rise. Uh, if it's not controlled, of course, this will uh, lead to the uh, premature birth of a baby. And this is one of the most common complications that we see here in our region with, with females that are pregnant. So what do you do as a, as a patient care, as an assistant? Uh, if headache, blurred vision, uh, severe heartburn, decreased urinary output, these are the signs of preeclampsia. So again, we don't wanna let it progress through eclampsia. So we have to report these things right away. When you look at the female and you look at their legs and they're very puffy and they become even more puffy, okay? They start to get shorter breath, they become irritable, right? These are the signs that the person is uh, is getting a uh, uh, eclamptic or preeclamptic. So something has to be done. Otherwise, the uh, the fetus will become compromised uh, and may even uh, have spontaneous spontaneous birth. So that is a very common and also very uh, serious complication. It can it can uh, experience strokes or even heart attacks depending on the condition of the patient.
So we know what gestational diabetes is, right? Develop, uh, diabetes develops in the pregnancy, sometimes the second trimester, four or five months, already when the baby's already increasing the demands of insulin. Uh, the baby may grow too large because of the increased insulin. Remember, insulin is a growth hormone. So the babies will grow like that, okay? So if you see ladies that are pregnant and they eat a lot, they're eating a lot, and what happens is your body will start producing all this insulin, okay? Insulin to meet the, uh, the sugar levels that can need to be used. Well, at the same time, all this glucose and all this insulin is going through the baby, and that baby becomes to grow, grow. You know, we see babies seven pounds or, or bigger. We call them macro babies, very large. Um, and they have very, um, very similar characteristics. Right? And they're not only chubby babies, but um, they also have their, their, their wrinkles, like the like usually the, the scrotum of the babies become very dark because of all the insulin. If you see uh, adults now that have marks on their neck, you know, sometimes on their axilla or here in the waist, wherever the, the, their skin folds, you see dark pigmentation. Okay, this is, a, this is called insulin resistance. And you see this a lot, again, also on the babies where they have large amounts of insulin going through the bloodstream. So gestational diabetes, again, something that has to be managed uh, properly during pregnancy. Usually it's managed with insulin treatment to make sure that the insulin levels stay within the normal range. Now, uh, what other complications uh, can we see? The placenta, the placenta is where the baby is inside. Uh, obviously the placenta can also develop problems, okay? So the fetus is developing in the placenta where the baby is, this is the bag, right? Um, it's pretty much the, the way they get everything, right? All their nutrients, all their oxygen, everything is in the placenta. And uh, the last thing we need is for that placenta to be um, to start to leak, to start to to lose some of that fluid because that is the lifeline of the baby. So the the placenta is it's like I don't know how you call it. It's like a fountain. So it's a fountain of blood, and it's attached to the to the uterus. The placenta has obviously the, the umbilical cord, right? And it attaches to the baby with the umbilicus. And if that placenta starts to detach from the uterus, you have a problem called placenta previa. So that's why it's very important that the baby, when it, uh, when it starts to develop, when the fertilized egg attaches to the uterus, okay, let's say this is your placenta, uh, your uterus, you want this fertilized egg to plant as high as possible, right? In the thickest part of the uterus, so that when it starts to develop, okay, it stays on there. Okay, if it latches on there towards the bottom of the uterus, this is when you start to see some um, incompetent cervix that aren't able to hold the baby and so on. But here, uh, placental complications are also pretty common, and uh, sometimes it's, it's it's one of the main problems that females have miscarriages because if the female has a very weak uh, uterine walls. The placenta, when it starts to develop, it falls off quickly. And again, this is when you see spontaneous miscarriages because the the embryos or the developing embryos and, and the placenta itself doesn't it's not even able to to um, to develop properly, and it just it just lost. So we have the problem of a miscarriage. So before they get pregnant, uh, females should really have good health. Uh, make sure they're their iron counts, their blood counts are as best as possible, and then just have overall general good health. So uh, separation of the placenta before delivery obviously can, can cause baby death, such as in a um, uh, spontaneous um, abortion. Uh, so there's other problems uh, we call abruptio placentae. Abruptio placentae is the separation of the placenta from the wall of the uterus before delivery. So, this is what I was just explaining right now. What happens when, when the, what can happen if this placenta uh, detaches from, from the uterus? Obviously you're gonna have a pre preterm baby and this is also very common. Uh, if the baby's already, you know, at least six months, five months, it's not really a problem anymore. A lot of the babies that are born nowadays are born at five or six months and they're still able to, you know, to, to live without any problems and develop, continue to develop without any problems. Um, but the women may feel uh, abdominal pain, a firm uterus. Sometimes we describe it as a, as a um, 
like a board, like if your abdomen becomes really, really firm, uh, their heart rate starts to go up, okay? Their blood pressure starts to drop. And this can be considered an emergency for the female, but also, I don't know, for the fetus, because pretty much the female can bleed to death if they, um, if they don't get attention. That's why when we see bleeding in a female, it's very, very important that something gets done. Uh, if the female uh, has any kind of clotting or bleeding, uh, it's a sign that there may be a little bit of a detaching from the uterus. So that's why uh, ultrasounds are, are done very frequently on females to catch this type of problem, either placenta previa or a virtual placenta or any other problems that may develop with the, with the, with the sac itself. It's uh, very important that they monitor this uh, on a regular basis. I think the ultrasounds are usually done uh, frequently, like you know, once a month and then twice a month and so on. As the woman gets closer to giving birth, the uh, the ultrasound come more frequently, especially if they have a high risk pregnancy, like hypertension, or the the obstetrician knows that the patient has this high risk for this or that kind of problem. The the ultrasounds are a very very useful tool to help them make make sure that the that the pregnancy comes to term. So preterm labor is another uh, complication that can occur. Any labor that happens before the, before the 37th week, okay, it's supposed to be how many? 38 weeks, something like that. So before the 37th week is a, considered a preterm. So we have preemie babies. So at this point, the fetus lungs may not have developed. That is one of the main problems. So if the fetus has not, does not come to term the whole nine months, uh, their lungs are in, uh, premature and the woman gives birth at around this time, then the child, the fetus, may uh, have trouble breathing or may get into respiratory failure. So this presents a very high risk for more so for the for the you know for the baby that's coming than for the mom. Um, the mother may be hospitalized, um, put on bed rest, made right, to prevent to stop this preterm labor. A lot of times we uh, give medications to to slow down the contractions if they're beginning. Uh, to give IV fluids, whatever the female requires to to slow down the the, the uh, preterm labor. Steroid medications are given to the baby if he is born, so those lungs can uh, can breathe easier if the baby does come to to, uh, to labor. A premature rupture of the membranes that means the the water sac, right? People know it as the uh, the fountain or or the water sac. Uh, this problem happened with uh, one of mine when my the last child that we had uh, around six or seven months. Um, mom was complaining that you know it, they felt like they were uh, urinating, felt like urine or fluid coming out, and uh, and it became more more often and more often. And her obstetrician uh, started to investigate and increase the frequency of the of the ultrasounds. To measure the amount of fluid that was in the in the membrane, and then it just became more often, and it happened that one uh, another obstetrician was covering for for the primary one, and uh, when she saw this problem, uh, right away she recognized that this is not good, because uh, if the membrane loses fluid, that means that the that the fetus is losing fluid, they're going to be dehydrated, and they can cause kidney damage. So at this point, the obstetrician decided to admit mom into the into the hospital. But fortunately, this was already at uh, about eight and a half months. So the baby, or actually more like eight months. So the baby was already almost a term, but uh, it was a you know it was a small baby, which was good. But uh, anyways, this can happen. The, uh, the premature rupture of membranes or the amniotic sac ruptures. Before the labor uh, begins, usually this this stack doesn't rupture until the actual um, contractions occur. Once the contractions occur, then the water breaks. You know, if you, you know the woman feels like a gush of fluid, you know, coming out, that means the water broke. Hopefully, it, you are at nine months at this point or close to the nine months. But uh, anything before the again the 37th week would be considered a premature rupture of the membranes. And of course, this is an emergency. The baby has to come out regardless uh, because there is no lifeline for the for the baby anymore. The uterus will start to contract 
and there's no stop in the uterus anymore. The baby will have to come out and probably be be uh, taken care of in the hospital until the baby is mature enough to, to breathe on his own. So this uh, sac again, this, this where the baby lives, you know, it's, it's like their little mobile home. And um, this premature rupture puts the mother at, and the fetus at risk for infections, uh, kidney problems. Okay, usually uh, any woman with uh, with premature rupture will start going to labor usually within 24 hours, if not earlier. So this is again is considered an emergency, uh, and it happens pretty often. A lot of females uh, do not carry the baby to term, especially if they if they have other other high risk conditions such as the ones we talked about about uh, diabetes, uh, heart disease, okay, uh, and uh, what else? So the problems that any gestational problems that they might have hyperemesis, um, gravidarum, which is the excess vomiting. So there's a lot of problems that can occur uh, as a result of a premature rupture of the membrane. So I'm going to take a little pause right here. And then we're going to continue in just a minute. Some females uh, will have more than one baby. And we call this multiple gestation multiple pregnancies at once, one, two, three, four, five, and we've heard of even you know more than five, uh, as the amount of um, embryos uh, or, you know, or gestations happen in the uterus that also increases the risk of um, complications for the female. Multiple gestations, uh, you know, in increase the, the demands of the body uh, a lot, especially the heart. So having uh, diabetes, hypertension, or other uh, problems will of course, place the, the pregnancy at high risk. Uh, monozygotic means um, one egg, okay, one egg. So we have twins that are monozygotic means you have identical twins, okay? So one egg uh, with one sperm and they form in the same, in the same bag. Uh, dizygotic twins, it means you have two eggs and one sperm and they usually develop in separate bags. So we have, um, what's called fraternal twins. So monozygotic are identical twins and the dizygotic are fraternal twins. Okay. So, so who's going to be the one to, to help you de uh, deliver the baby? Back in the day, obviously it was a, a what do you call it? A, a midwife, right? A person uh, that had experience in giving birth. Pretty much anybody can give birth if it's a normal, non-complicated, uh, delivery or pregnancy, uh, anybody can give birth, okay? In general, if you're with a pregnant woman and the baby's coming, there's no stopping that. You have to let it come, right? So the baby's coming, usually the head will come in, okay? That's what they call the, the or even before the, 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 the head, there's terms for everything. So once your water breaks, right, the baby begins to, to position. By this time, the baby's head should be facing down, right? Because that's what's going to come up first. Uh, sometimes uh, females don't have, the baby's not even ready that. So some of the, the midwives or the doctors have to maneuver the baby into that position, okay? So the uterus right here, way up here, right? And the baby's head is way down here, okay? And once you start, um, the uterus starts contracting, starts pushing the baby down. Sometimes females feel like the, the baby is uh, kind of drops. I think that's the word they use. Okay, the baby drops. Okay, they call it lightning, like like something that is lighter, like the the weight just goes down. Uh, so the baby begins to move down into the pelvis. The abdomen will change. It doesn't look as bulky as it was as it was uh, was before, and uh, you feel that dropping. Did you ever feel that uh, that dropping? Days before my water broke. Oh really? So, okay, you, you probably got scared. You thought, you know, you were having a miscarriage. No, se miraba como huevo, así como la clara del huevo, así crudo, así. So it was like, okay, what the hell is this? Pero. <laughs> <laughs> no, ya después el doctor me dijo lo mismo. Okay. So, but, you know, after the first one, obviously, after the, the first one, you already knew, like, okay, you know what it is. It's normal, right? Um, so, again, 
um, after the bloody show, okay, you start, the woman will start to have those, what they call the, the fake contractions, the Braxton Hicks contractions. They're irregular. They don't happen often. You get like one, and then 20, 30 minutes later, you get another one. So they're not in a regular pattern, okay? They call them the Braxton Hicks contractions. These are not true contraction, like from the uterus, okay? And this is why a lot of uh, females usually panic. They think they're going into, into labor already, but in reality, it's just, uh, and the, these contractions, usually they, they feel like from the back, the, the, the women report uh, like cramping, like from the back, starts from the back, okay? And as you know, contractions when you're in birth start from here, right? Your pain is right here. Uh, so they're very different, okay? So uh, usually when the females call the ER and uh, pregnant, given birth, you know, and I have this, they ask you, how, how frequent are your contractions? And they say, well, you know, I had one like 30 minutes ago. Okay, so they're not frequent. So that means that you have to wait. Okay, it's not time uh, for you to come in into the ER unless you're really, you know, you're having the contractions very often. So now you're actually going uh, into the labor. Okay, the first stage of labor, okay, uh, for females <clears throat> that are preemies, we call preemie para. That means your preemie is one, uh, primero. And para means pregnancy. So your preemie para, right? And then if you had more than one, then you are a multi-para. So if you're a female that had more than uh, one pregnancy, uh, then you're going to be called a multi-para, okay? A woman has delivered a baby before. The first stage of labor lasts an average about six to eight hours. And that's that's what you said. You last about eight hours. And then the, the, the delivery or the stages of labor are divided into phases, okay? So the first stage, and then you have different phases. In the early latent phase, early latent phase, uh, you have the discomfort, you have the backache, okay? Uh, you really haven't started to give birth. The contractions are usually regular, five to eight minutes apart, lasting 20 to 35 seconds. But they're not very, very strong contractions, okay? Yes, they are painful, you feel, but they're not really strong, and they're not that frequent. Then you move on to mid or active phase. Um, usually, before in the first uh, phase, you're about three centimeters dilated, which is about mm, about that much, right? So no way the baby's coming out like this, right? So as the contractions uh, occur, the cervix starts to dilate even more and more. When you go into the mid or active phase, the contraction is now more frequent, three to three to five minutes apart, so very, very frequent. Uh, you dilate from four to seven millimeters, so that's about four, maybe about that much. Okay, so this is a bit more reasonable. Okay, so again, we're talking about normal vaginal birth. So the, the cervix is dilating that much. Okay, and then you go into the transition phase. At this, at this phase, the baby's head is already coming down. Okay, the baby's coming down. By this point, you should be at least 10 millimeters uh, dilated. That's usually when the when the physicians, you know, uh, actually uh, stimulate you know, more the the, the uterus to contract so that so that um, cervix can dilate. I think there's um, a medication that they also give to females so that the cervix can actually relax and they can dilate. Sometimes females take very long to dilate, okay? And of course, it's not good. Why? Because if the baby's already coming and the cervix is not dilated enough, the baby can get stuck in there, unable to come out, and they're going to be starting to get short of breath. And this is when we see a lot of complications of babies um, developing uh, mental retardation because if they're there and they can't get out, they're not going to be getting oxygen. That baby needs to come out like ASAP. So we give a medication to dilate the cervix so that baby can come out. So now once it, 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 it comes out here, we can see the hair, you know, the bloody hair and the head and all stuff. We call that crowning. When the baby's already right there, you can see it. It's called crowning. Uh, the contractions continue, and so you go into the second stage of labor, okay? So the first stage finishes when you see crowning, okay? So you have the, the early latent phase, and then you have mid-phase, and then you have active phase, okay? Remember, you're dilating from 3 and 4 to 7 and 7 to 10. Now you're at 10 millimeters. So now you, this is when you start really pushing, right? The second stage of labor begins with a complete dilation of the cervix to 10 millimeters, or I'm sorry, 10 centimeters, 
and ends with the baby's birth. So the stage uh, lasts an average of 20 to 50 minutes. Uh, it is uh, probably the most painful stage of, uh, of, the, of the labor process. Um, if your baby is a big baby and baby does not want to come out of the, through the, through the, through the vaginal canal, through the birth canal, uh, the doctor may have to do an episiotomy, right? If the baby has a big head or he's just a big baby, uh, the vagina or the woman is very small. They will have to do a, an episiotomy, which means a little incision, right? Cutting towards the towards the towards the anus, uh, so to allow the head to, to come out. And uh, once the head continues to come out, then usually the, the doctor will then help the baby come out easier. They have to maneuver the baby. Usually, comes out in the sternum, so the elbows can come out. It's a very, um, I guess. Um, I want to say strange process, but it's uh, it's 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 very, I don't know, a miraculous process when you see that baby come out, you know, fully develop, and it's just amazing to see that the kid come out. Uh, once the once the baby is uh, extracted, right, uh, they need to breathe on their own. Right? They need to be able to breathe on their own. Uh, usually, uh, that's uh, in the suction, the airways, the nose, and the mouth. And uh, they tickle or they pinch the baby so they, their lungs can expand and they can start breathing on their own. Once they start crying or breathing on their own, that that's pretty much that's pretty much it, right? For the baby, okay. They clean them up and they show them to mom and hold the baby and all that good stuff. And um, but the labor process is not quite done. There's still something inside you, right? The placenta is still there. This is the third stage of labor. The the placenta has to be delivered. Remember, the placenta is what latches onto the uterus. Okay, it's, it has a, the cord, right? It goes to the to the baby. This also has to get extracted. So your your uterus is still contracting, 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 because if this uterus doesn't detach and doesn't come out, then you got a problem. So the uterus has to be expelled, and um, it is usually about what ten minutes after you give birth, the placenta will come out by itself. Hopefully, there'll be a lot of blood loss. It gets, it gets really bloody, but that's part of giving birth. So you may, uh, you know, TNAs, patient cares, or if you work in this area, it can get um, pretty bloody, pretty messy. So you have to provide a lot of perineal care for the female, ice packs to release swelling. Uh, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot of work for for the female, for the mom. So she needs to be taken care of. Um, of course, we don't just care for the you know for that particular area but we care for the whole person you know the whole patient um their emotional state their physiological their vital signs we have to be monitoring everything at the same time so once the the placenta is is delivered then the third stage of labor is completed um the fourth stage and the final stage of labor begins with the delivery of the placenta so it's already out the woman's condition has stabilized uh Usually two to four hours, the vital signs are almost back to normal. Uh, usually on IV fluids, um, they may be, of course, hungry, you know, because usually they're, they're, you know, you can't eat until after you give birth. Um, if there are no complications, so she can go back to eat. The babies uh, have no complications. Um, they're examined, and they're cleaned up, and they're bathed, and they're probably returned to the mom again. Uh, I'm not sure when they ask you for the name. I always miss that part. When do they ask you for the name? Uh, the mother wants to attempt breastfeeding. Uh, the mom will be assisted, of course, by the nurses. But um, remember, the babies that are born very big uh, are going to be born very hungry. So uh, it's important to to feed those babies right away. I'm a big fan of breastfeeding uh, because it's the best um, milk there is for the babies. It has sugar, has all the nutrients, has antibodies, it has everything that the baby needs to be able to develop. Uh, you know, healthy and strong. So, again, the fourth stage of labor, um, you know, all your vital signs are back to normal, okay? However, uh, when you go home, right, the risk of uh, postpartum complications. So after you've given birth, the postpartum hemorrhage is still at risk because your uterus is trying to get back to its normal state. It takes about six weeks before your uterus, right, um, can, can, can return to its normal stage. Uh, we call this uh, what is the quarantine, right? Not quarantine. Uh, 
that's another word for it. But uh, you, you know, the woman is usually having like a, a, some spotting, some you know, a little bit of bleeding. Uh, but they should never have you know hemorrhaging like that. So the woman has to be instructed right how to how to measure the amount of bleeding. Okay, if it becomes too heavy, then obviously they have to be uh, they have to be taken to the hospital for possible hemorrhage. Um, the vital signs, uh, you know, the blood, the heart rate usually is the one that tells you when somebody's bleeding too much, the heart rate goes up. Okay, so it's important to monitor the heart rate, of course, the breathing and all that. But the the bleeding part, you know, has to be uh, kept on. Obviously, what do you, what's the name of that? Um, all right. So usually, again, the uh, the female will continue their their postpartum recovery in the home. They usually discharge the next day. Now, the woman may have had um, a urinary catheter uh, placed uh, once after birth. The uh, once they recover, the fem the catheter will be removed. The mom is encouraged to drink fluids and start ambulating, start walking, so that the bladder can empty itself and they can go home without any problem. So this is normally what happens with a with a uh, with a normal vaginal delivery. Now. Some females are not candidates for normal vaginal delivery because of the complications that we mentioned earlier, especially hypertension. Uh, it, it can really put a lot of stress on the heart. So for that reason, many females are, are going to be candidates for uh, a C-section or cesarean deliveries. Uh, they may have an incompetent cervix. They may have a, uh, you know, a weak uh, uh, urine walls, which will require them have a cesarean section. So this could be another option. <clears throat> the size of the shape of the pelvis, maybe the, the, the mom is the female has a very small pelvis where it's going to complicate the, you know, the, the, um, the baby won't be able to come out. Uh, they call this the fallow pelvic uh, disproportion, which means the baby's head okay, is unable to pass through that. So if, if they measure the head and they measure the pelvis of the, of the woman and they see that the female is just, you know, too small, then uh, C-section is going to be indicated. Uh, if the baby is coming in in a wrong position, if the head is not coming down like it's Sir, supposed to be. So we, one of the reasons is the fellow uh, pelvic disproportion with the head and the pelvis, is, you know, they're not, the pelvis is too small. Uh, abnormal fetal presentation, meaning the baby is coming in the wrong position. If they're coming with the butt down, it's called the breech presentation, obviously the baby is not going to be able to come out like that. So if the baby is not in position, again, uh, C-section is indicated. If they come with a shoulder first, that's not going to work either. Uh, they're going to have to have a, a C-section. If they had a pre previous C-section in the past, uh, if future babies possibly may have to be delivered by C-section because um, once there's a cut in the muscle, of the uterus, uh, and they try to have a normal, uh, a normal uh, delivery. It's not going to happen because the walls are very weak and they can rupture, and obviously they can cause hemorrhage, and the woman can die uh, very, very quickly. So, vaginal birth after C-section is possible, right? If it's a normal, uncomplicated uh, pregnancy, like if it's a small child, if it's going to be a big baby, and the doctor thinks you know it's too risky for you to have a, you know, it's going to cause too much pressure uh, on the walls of the uterine and you may start bleeding and so on. So, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of factors that the doctor will consider uh, to be able to go, you know, C-section versus natural route. Now, what are other complications that can occur during the labor and delivery process? Uh, dystocia, uh, dystocia is one of the terms used to describe a long and difficult, you know, um, delivery, okay? Uh, when a woman is in is labor for too long, that can uh, put the, we call it, uh, the baby at risk, more so because of the lack of oxygen that can happen. If the urine doesn't contract strong enough, uh, the fetal, uh, the baby all of a sudden turns and it's not coming the right, um, the right direction, right, right presentation, uh, multiple pregnancies, or dehydration can also cause dystocia or long, uh, prolonged uh, labor, labor uh, stage of labor. 
if the uterine ruptures, that's a, that's a severe, uh, you know, uh, uh, complication. I mean, the baby can die right away if the uterine ruptures. The baby will bleed uh, to death. <clears throat> again, this is why, again, the person who has had a, a previous C-section is not a candidate for normal C-sections again. Uh, prolapse cord. Uh, prolapse cord was known to cause a lot of the uh, congenital problems. A lot sometimes the umbilical cord would wrap around the baby's neck, and when they're coming down, it would pull on it, right, because it's still attached to the placenta, and the baby would be without oxygen for a determined amount of time. We, we can be without oxygen, you know, more than three, five minutes, otherwise we have brain damage. And this is one of the things that can happen. The cord uh, loops around the, the baby's neck and usually causes the baby to, to have lack of oxygen. So there's a lot of complications that can occur even during the, the, um, the, the delivery. And uh, now we have something called a, a, a fetal monitor. We have a machine that we have patches, kind of like an ultrasound, but it, it monitors the baby's heart rate. It monitors, uh, I forget what it is, uh, the baby's, um, it's the pulse, the heart rate, and also the, the contractions, the contractions of the mother. If the contractions are too weak or too strong, uh, too frequent, you know, and so on, and the baby reacts to the contractions. Uh, when, uh, when I was going to my clinicals, this is one of the most important things that, that, uh, that they test us on, uh, to be able to, to read kind of like an EKG, but in this case, it's called the fetal monitor. So we have to evaluate if the, the baby or the mom is, uh, or the baby is going through what's called fetal distress, if they're having increased heart rate or if they're lacking oxygen and so on. We have to make sure that we're able to read those, those tracings. All right, so postpartum complications, what can happen, right? And I was asking you earlier, what's the name of that, that, that period when you're unable to, um, uh, I guess to, to hemorrhage is a serious complication that can occur. Uh, late postpartum hemorrhage, uh, usually, uh, you know, after the first week or even up to the six weeks, uh, there might be some placenta, right? Part of the placenta is still coming out, uh, little pieces that were stuck in there. So uh, this could be a possible complication. Another um, complication that can occur is infection because the high amounts of blood that is in there. Okay, and uh, it's just a lot of uh, uh, residue from the placenta. Uh, they can lead to an infection. We call it a corporal infection. Corporal infection it develops after childbirth. Uh, the uterus is affected. Uh, not the not the rest of just the uterus. Uh, UTIs, uh, infection, urinary tract infections can occur. Wound infections from the episiotomy if they had one. So there's a lot of infections that can occur. Um, the woman uh, not show, does not show any signs of corporal infection until 10 or more days after the delivery. So it's really important that um, any foul odors uh, be reported, any abnormal discharge or things like that. And of course, um, they probably will require oral antibiotics for that. <clears throat> and the last um, possible complication that can occur. Uh, and this Depression, sir, también was, is part of uh, a complication. Uh, why does postpartum depression happen? Yo pienso que es the, hor the hormone. The last complication that, that can occur after giving birth, if the woman is not ambulatory, if they, they decide to no, because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be here just resting, recuperating, and they rest and recuperate for a long time. If they have bad circulatory uh, or they have circulatory problems, they have heart disease, they have diabetes, or even high blood pressure, that can uh, uh, cause them to develop what's called thrombophlebitis or little blood clots in the leg. The little blood clots can cause swelling in the leg uh, and even pain. And if those little blood clots can actually travel back up to, to your lung and cause respiratory problems. Because even though you were just, you know, uh, giving birth for, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, a couple of hours, maybe five, eight hours, but before then, maybe you were resting, or afterwards, maybe you were a bit bound, you were not walking, you're not doing your normal routine. You can develop little blood clots in the superficial veins, the veins in your legs. They can develop very, very small blood clots. 
and these they call uh, thrombo uh, phlebitis or something called deep venous thrombosis. These uh, these blood clots can stay there. They will cause swelling on the leg, and one leg is skinny, and then the other leg is swollen, and that's the sign that you have probably a an embolism or a blood clot in your leg. And uh, now you got to get more treatment for that because if that little blood clot travels up to your lungs, you can have respiratory failure. If it travels to your heart, you can have a heart attack. If it goes to your brain, you can have a stroke. So thrombophobias are very real. They're very serious. Uh, that need to be treated. So we have to keep an eye, uh, an eye out for this. Um, and this usually, again, it can be resolved uh, with blood thinners, with medications, uh, anticoagulants, uh, and so on. Uh, the doctor may even opt out to give the female a, um, a medication, uh, injections right after birth, right after the baby is delivered, start the female on injections to, to help prevent further blood clots from developing and maybe help this little blood clot um, dissolve and go away. Uh, usually treatment for this thrombophlebitis is about six months of uh, anticoagulant medications. And of course, lab work and so on. And it becomes a very difficult problem to manage. So thrombophlebitis is one of the last complications that can occur uh, after pregnancy along with infection and hemorrhage. So again, uh, even though the delivery of baby's gone home, everybody's happy, uh, complications can still occur. So we have to educate the patients a lot uh, right after delivery, make sure that they're keeping an eye on them, uh, taking good care of themselves so they don't come back to the 